So let's talk a bit more about RSA. Now we've talk, covered RSA a few times on this channel. Um, it's extremely prevalent and important public key al um, algorithm. And it's used a lot in digital signatures and things like this. We're gonna skip a bit over how RSA works in, you know, in all the mathematical detail. But you have two keys, right? You have a public key and a private key. And what typically RSA is used for is you sign something using the private key and then you verify something, you verify that signature with the public key. Now the public key is going to be some value E and a very large number N, and the private key is going to be D. E and N are not secrets, because so this is public, and D is the, the private key. E is usually 65537, which I mentioned before, best number ever, and then N is a very large, some, somewhat random number, right? And it's gonna be somewhere like 2,000 bits, maybe even 4,000 bits long. So how do we calculate N? Well, when we generated this key, the person who has the secret key, they generated N by calculating P, times by q. These are two prime numbers, so they use some kind of primality test, some kind of random number generation, to generate two random values, p and q. Multiply them together, used this n, this e, and various other bits of maths to calculate the private key, and then, and then essentially, for the sake of this conversation, delete all this inform intermediate information, and then just publish e and n on the web somewhere, or on a certificate. Now, I was reading an article the other day um, by a researcher called Hanno Bock, uh, and what he'd found was that there are various um, systems that are using a library that generates a weak value for P and Q. Right? The values for P and Q where we can break the RSA key and essentially recalculate D, right? which is absolutely not what you want to happen. Right? If you have a server that's signing things with a private key and you can work out what that private key is, you can then sign things as that server and so essentially pretend to be that server. Right? It's a huge problem because you can basically convince someone's browser that you are an online shop and it would be a really good idea if they gave you their credit card details. Right? So that's not, that's not what we want. To break RSA, what we actually have to do, if you imagine you've just been given N, right, we have to split it into P and Q. Right? Now why is that? Let's talk a bit about that process. Right? So you've got E and N as an attacker, you've just been given E and N, and what, we, what our goal is to do is to calculate D. So let's imagine that you can factor N into P and Q. Right? So you can say, okay, I've worked out what P is and I've worked out what Q is. Then you can calculate something called the Euler totient of N, which is actually, in this case, equal to P minus one times by Q minus one. Right? Now, we're gonna skip over what that is and why, right? But the point is that as an attacker, that's all we're interested in doing. Right? As an attacker, we factor N into P and Q, we use this formula to calculate the totient of N, right? and then we can use this equation, E multiplied by D is congruent to one mod the totient of N. I shouldn't have put an extra bracket in there, I don't know why I did that. Right? So what does this mean? Well, it means that basically what we want to do is we've got E, because it's public, E is 65537, right? We want to find some number that when we multiply by E, we get an intermediate value, which when we reduce mod the totient of N, we get one again, right? And if we do that, we've calculated our private key D, because that's the actual formula for calculating D. Now, normally you wouldn't be able to, as an attacker, compute this, right? Because you wouldn't have the totient of N. You don't know what P and Q are, because you've just given N, you're not given the factorization P and Q, so you can't use this formula, so you can't calculate totient of N, which means you can't do this. Right. That's essentially the, uh, how it works. The key here is that P and Q are a secret. Right? So, could we calculate the totient of N in some other way? Yes, right? you could use brute force. Um, it would take you longer than a lifetime in the universe, or some unrealistic amount of time. The fastest way, really, to calculate the totient of N, and hence to calculate the private key, is just to factor N into P and Q. Now, factoring N, which means finding its prime factors, is not difficult if N is small. Right? So if N is 30, well, one of the factors is two, right? Two, that gives us 15, three, and five. That, that was it, right? So I'm not a genius, it just wasn't very difficult. Now, if N is 4,000 bits long or 2,000 bits long, and you don't have one of the factors as two, so you can make your problem instantly double as easy, this is very, very much more difficult, right? It's so difficult that there aren't very many good algorithms to do it, unless you choose P and Q badly. So imagine that P and Q are the same, right? in which case P is the square root of N, right? There are algorithms for that, right? That's not so difficult. So my suggestion would be if you're picking random primes P and Q, you don't use the same prime twice, right? That would be the first one. 
But the other thing is, what you might accidentally do is generate two prime numbers quite close together. Right? So, you know, you can imagine that if this is the square root of n, one of them might be a little bit bigger and one of them will be a bit smaller, but they'll, add, they'll multiply together to get n. Um, if they're only very, very close together, you might imagine intuitively it's a little bit easier to find what the factorization is. And then once you've factored it, you can just do these steps to completely recalculate the private key. So a really good method for doing this when P and Q are thought maybe not to be that far apart is Fermat's factorization algorithm. Right? And that's what this researcher, Hanno, was using to do his attack. Right? And the way it works is basically like this. So we know that N is P and Q. Right? Now, there's also another neat trick that we know, which is that some composite number n is the difference of two square numbers. Right? So it's going to be some, some a squared that we don't know minus some b squared that we don't know. Now, we can also rewrite this as a plus b times by a minus b. Right? Now, we're not going to delve into too much detail, right? but this is basically the core of the algorithm. Now, that's p and that's q, or vice versa. It doesn't really matter which one. If we could work out what these intermediate values a and b are, then we can use this little formula here to work out what p and q are. What I've done is rewritten a formula. I haven't actually shown that we can do it any more easily. But we can rewrite this to be b squared is equal to a squared minus n. What we do for the Fermat's factorization algorithm is we say, OK, what's a good guess for a? Well, a, let's say the square root of n is about roughly where we want to start, and we want to start moving up through the a's to try and find plausible solutions to this equation. So we say that our initial guess for a is going to be the square root of n and then the integer immediately above that. That's the ceiling function. So if the square root of n is, you know, 0.7, we just go up to the next integer above. Right? Now, we do that, so we pick our a, we calculate a squared minus our original n, and we see what we get out. And what we get out has to be a square number. It has to be a number that has a, an integer square root, because if it doesn't, this doesn't work. Right? And it didn't. So what we do is we add 1 to a, and we try it again. We square a, we subtract the original value, and we find if we've got a square number. Right? Now, this is not trivial to do in terms of the, the amount of computation to calculate these large square roots and things, but it's not that bad. And the, the interesting thing about Fermat's factorization method is if p and q are fairly close to each other, this will give you a solution for p and q extremely quickly. You'll do a few iterations, you'll get an a where you square it, you minus n, and you've got a square number. Then you know what a and b are. And then you can do a plus b, a minus b to get p and q, and you've broken RSA. Right? So let's have a quick look, and I'll show you. So we're going to use sage maths for this. Right? Now, I love sage math. Essentially, think of it like it's Python, but with a bunch more maths in it. <laughs> um, you know, if you use MATLAB or Octave or some other mathematical library or Mathematica or something, it's, it's one of those kind of things. I like it because it's, um, it's got a lot of sort of helpful stuff for cryptography, but also um, because I know Python quite well. And so, it, you know, it's easy. Now, it, it's a command prompt that says Sage on it, but actually it's basically Python, right? So I can write normal Python. Now, what I've done is I've got a weak N. Right, so what I did was I picked two random primes that were not that different and I multiplied them together and got an n and I've forgotten what the primes are and deleted them. Right? So n equals, and I'm going to paste it in, and it's a very, very large number. I don't know how many digits it is, but some number of digits is quite big. I can go n dot n bits is 2046. So it's actually it's marginally smaller than 2048, but it's not bad. Right? Now, so n is my, n is my very large part of the public key. Let's say my other component is 65537. As an attacker, what we want to do is break n into p and q, we can calculate the totient of n, we can calculate the private key d, and then we can wreak all kinds of havoc on the web. Um, but don't, by the way. Um, now, because I haven't chosen p and q properly at random, they are actually quite similar. So the first half of p and the first half of q, they were 1000 bit numbers. The first half, the first roughly 500 bits were identical for both, and then they're random on the tail end, like the second half. Um, and that means that they've got still got 512 bits that are different. They're not the same number at all. And if you were counting up from one to the other, it would take you many thousands of years to do. But this factorization method breaks them very, very quickly. So let's code it up. Let's first calculate our initial guess for A. Right, so A is going to be the integer square root, which is essentially the integer down from the square root of n plus 1. So that's the ceiling. Right? I could have, could have just used the ceiling function. We won't dwell on it. So a is 
some implausibly large number. And what we're going to do is we're going to calculate a squared minus n and see if that's a square number. And then we're going to increment a and just keep going until we get one. And then we can calculate p and q. So um, I'm going to write uh, a little bit of code to do this. While true, don't use while true most of the time. I'm, I'm cheating. While true, let's calculate b squared is equal to a to the power of 2 minus n. All right, hopefully this will work. And then if is square, as an aside, the thing I like about sage maths is they've already implemented things like is square, so I don't have to bother implementing it by myself. Sounds like a lot of work. I don't like doing a lot of work for my tax. So if b2 is a square, we've already solved the algorithm, right? So we're going to do, then we're going to calculate b is equal to the square root of b2. Otherwise, and then we're going to break and out of our loop. If not, we're going to do a equals a plus 1, right? And it's already finished. Right? I think it was about 10 iterations of this before we hit on the correct day. It's just ridiculous how quickly this works. So I can say a is that number, b is this number. And so we can now say p is equal to a plus b and q is equal to a minus b. Right? And then we can just do a check. So p is this, is p a prime, p dot is prime. Thinking about it, primality test, witness numbers. Yes, it is. Right, and I could do the same for Q. So it's looking good. And then the last test is to see if P times Q is equal to N. So N is equal to P times Q. True, right? So we factored N into P and Q. Now actually, I could now calculate the, um, the private key. So let's suppose E is 65537, right? Then what I do is I calculate the totient of N. So 5N is equal to p minus 1 times q minus 1. And then we have to calculate the multiplicative inverse, which is d. d is equal to inverse mod, it might be mod inverse, let's find out, of e and phi of n. d. Oops, that's not true. d. There we go. So e is that and d is that. So I've already calculated the private key. Not a lot of work. Incidentally, the algorithm you use to calculate the multiplicative inverse is the extended Euclidean algorithm. So that's implemented in here as well. I know you said that this is for kind of like weak numbers. Yeah. Potentially, could it work for any RSA number? So this will eventually return the answer, but eventually it is, is it relative. Um, when the numbers are very close to the square root of n, then this will return within, you know, 10, 20, 30, maybe a maximum of 100 iterations will return the number, right? For any, you know, so for example, for thousand bit numbers, if the, if the last 500 bits are the same, they are way too close together. Right? If you were actually generating values for P and Q properly, you wouldn't want to generate values that you almost even had the same number of bits. You know, they, they want to be somewhere around 1024 bits, but you don't want to enforce it. And maybe, um, and maybe you need to make some effort to generate them properly. So one way that they generate, which is not entirely uniform, but it's not bad, is you pick a random number and then you just increment it and find the next prime up from that number. So what you would not want to do is pick a number and find the next prime up and the next prime down or something like that because they're only going to be maybe a thousand or a hundred apart. That's not going to work. They're going to be very close to the square root. So what you do is you pick some random number, you find the next prime, you pick an entirely different random number, maybe not even the same length, find the next prime and then they are going to be sufficiently different. If the numbers are very, very far apart, the factorization method becomes you know, impossibly slow because you're doing all this extra square rooting and things that you don't need to do. Right? And there are better factorization methods out there. So you wouldn't ever use it apart from in the really easy cases. It didn't take me long to prove whether or not this was a weak, a weak number. right? So what you could do, and in fact what this researcher did, was look at some publicly available keys and just find out whether they're weak by just simply whether this returned within 100 iterations. So it's extremely easy to find out if this n is, has got weak a weak P and Q. And so you have to be extremely careful generating these random values. Right? A lot of thought goes into generating random primes than I am going into just doing the justice of in this video. Right? Um, it's, it's not simply a case of calling math.random and then is it a prime? Right? There's, a lot, there's a lot to it. Idea. It's called Psycho Baby. It's, out, it's after Doctor Who, isn't it? Right? So it's been a while since I've watched Doctor Who, but the idea is that Doctor uh, Who keeps showing people this blank piece of paper and it's psychic paper, which means that they see some identification that means... So I multiply it with itself 29 times on the clock, and the number I end up with is 18.